got a question for you. What is the oldest book in the Bible? Which one was written first? Go. Okay, yeah, that's great. I'm glad George sat at the front. Okay. Um, so there are different opinions, but one of, the, one of the big contenders for the oldest one is the book of Job. And I want to share a verse with you from what is possibly the oldest book in the Bible. Right back at the very beginning, Job says these words, chapter 19, verse 25. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. That's what Job says. I know that my Redeemer lives, and in the end he will stand upon the earth. Right back at the very beginning, right back at the start, this man could say with the eyes of faith, looking forward, not just to Christ coming and dying, but beyond that, to the resurrection, I know my Redeemer lives. And then even further into the future, one day, he's coming back. He'll stand upon the earth, and I'll meet him, and I'll be with him. Isn't that sweet? And isn't that the joy of all of us who are Christians here this morning, that we know that our Redeemer lives. And one day he's coming back. And so it's our privilege to be here this morning, to worship him, to, to celebrate his great victory over death. And so we'll do that, taking these words, we'll stand and we'll sing together, I know that my Redeemer lives, what joy the blessed assurance gives. We're going to pray together. And then I'm going to ask you to come and do uh, the reading for us. Do you know you're doing the reading? Great, great. Go on, I'll pick up you then instead. Good. Let's pray and then Grant will come and do our first reading for us. Oh. Father, we thank you for these sweet words from Job, from an Old Testament Christian, an Old Testament believer in the Lord Jesus, that there was a Messiah coming, that the one who was promised even as far back as Genesis 3 would come to earth and crush Satan's power, would stamp on the, the serpent's head, would ransom his people, save them from captivity in Satan's kingdom and bring them into the kingdom of the living God. Oh, we do say with the hymn that we've just sung, he lives all glory to his name. Father, we thank you for what the resurrection means to us. We thank you for the, the confirmation that it is that Jesus Christ was pure and sinless, that there was nothing wrong in him, that death had no claim on him, it couldn't keep its hands on him, because there was nothing in him for death to hold on to, no sin, no falseness, the things that are, are so prevalent, so obvious in our lives, none of them were in the Lord Jesus. He was pure, spotless, holy, the sinless Lamb of God. And yet, as we remembered on Good Friday, he was crushed, treated like the worst criminal. The sins of the world were laid on him. And he was punished in our place. Father, we thank you that we can be here this morning. We thank you for this song that you've put in our hearts, this burning hunger to know our Saviour more. We thank you for the promise that we have that one day we will be more than conquerors in the face of death because our Saviour, the Lord Jesus, has gone before us. He was the first fruits of all who will be resurrected, that we have our own resurrection day to look forward to. In that day when our Saviour, our Redeemer, will stand on the earth and we will see him without a veil. We will be with him and we will be like him. Our oh, Father, give us joy as we worship you this morning, as we remember what the resurrection means for each of us. May it be real to our hearts. May we know your Holy Spirit ministering to us, dealing with us, showing us afresh the greatness of the Lord Jesus, giving us a, a new, more spectacular vision of who he is. Fill our hearts and our minds with our Saviour this morning. We pray with all our hearts, more, more of Jesus. Oh, we pray that he would be with us, present amongst us as we worship you, adding his amen to all of our amens. We thank you that he stands for us.
your right hand, our great high priest. Oh, we love you, mighty Lord Jesus. Help us by your Holy Spirit to give you all the glory this morning, we pray. In your name, amen. Grant. Grant's going to read to us from Luke chapter 24 and the first 12 verses. Good morning, everyone. This is Luke's account of the resurrection in Luke 24, 1 to 12. <coughs> now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, and, and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices that they had prepared. But they found that the stone rolled away was rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. <coughs> then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James and the other woman with them who, who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down he said he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marvelling to himself at, at what had happened. I continue reading in this passage, Luke 24, and carrying on from verse 13. If you're just turning there now, and in the church Bible, it's on page 1047. Verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they walked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they'd seen a vision of angels and said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks broke it and began to give it to them. And their eyes were open, 
and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, <coughs> were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Two things I forgot to mention earlier. Um, you can see from here there's still a slot uh, for next Sunday evening um, for the young people's meeting after the evening service. So if you, uh, if you can open your, your home out to the young people, if you want to do that next Sunday evening, just come and, come and see me afterwards and I can let you know what that involves and, and what will need to be done in preparation for that. But it's a, a lovely time for, for us to be together. And do take advantage of that if you can. And then the other thing is, if you're, if you're visiting and you've got young children with us and uh, they, they get a bit upset or they get a bit angry during the sermon, there's a couple of rooms out the back with audio coming through, so you won't miss anything. You feel free to take them through and make, make use of those rooms if they're just uh, distracting you a bit too much. Don't hesitate to do so. Right, I've got a slide down. It's up there. And those of you who don't know what this is, well, you're going to find out. I'm not going to explain it, you're just going to find out. Somebody will uh, give me a guess straight away. Does anybody uh, think they know what this is going to be? Okay, go for mantis. it. Mantis. Uh, mantis. A mantis. A praying oh, it's a pretty, pretty good guess, actually. <laughs> not quite there, but that's a good start. Anybody else want to go for it? Let's get rid of it. Let's get rid of this. Or, uh, let's see if this works. No, and um, you're going to have to press it for me. Has to be a monkey. A, has to be monkey. a monkey, no, not quite. <laughs> okay, let's get rid of another one. And another one. A crab. A crab, yeah, that's pretty close, pretty close. Doesn't quite begin with M, but uh, getting... Yeah, flip those lights up for us, that's great. Um, let's have another square as well. This one's a bit tricky, eh? Let's have another one. And another one. And another one. <laughs> moth. A moth. No, it does look quite moth-like. You can see that. And another one. Uh... <laughs> and one more. Does anybody know what this is? Mosquito? No, it's not a mosquito. Okay, this is, you can click it for me, Anne. This is a mantis. Did you have that question? Oh, you knew what it was. Yeah, you're normally our experts. So was a to shout out. The mantis shrimp. So what we've been doing, for those of you who are visiting us, and there's quite a few of you this morning, we've been going through a, an animal alphabet and thinking about the lessons that we can draw from some of the more amazing creatures in our world. Now, the mantis shrimp is incredible for two reasons. Who thinks that they're pretty tough? Jack, you feel like you're pretty, pretty tough? Not, not sure at the moment. Josh, you're pretty tough. <laughs> Who thinks they've got a really good punch? I'm not going to ask you to come and demonstrate it. <laughs> Malcolm does. Malcolm thinks, yeah. I can. <laughs> so the mantis shrimp has the strongest punch of any animal in the animal kingdom. So it's got, there's a couple more pictures, and if you could just click twice more, and you can see what it looks like. So this thing grows to be about, normally about 30 centimeters long, can grow to 46 centimeters long. But you can see here, just under its, its carapace, it's got arms that kind of bend underneath like this, which it will extend very quickly. Let me tell you how quickly. When its arm goes out, it's with the same velocity as a bullet fired from a 2-2 rifle. That is how quick this thing can extend its arm. To put that into perspective, if we could extend our arms at a tenth of that speed, we could throw a cricket ball into orbit. <laughs> tenth of that speed. That would have been pretty handy for the black caps and the fire. <laughs> Imagine that. Eight golden ducks. <laughs> now their arms move so quickly that it can cause the water around them to boil. How crazy is that? I mean, there's a danger it can cook itself. <laughs> um, and it can produce a little shockwave through as those bubbles explode that can kill the prey even if they miss it with their arms. And so they're very rarely kept in aquariums because one, they kill everything else in there, 
and two, they've been known to punch through the glass and escape. They do that, a big one can punch through aquarium glass and escape, so they're a nightmare for aquarium owners. But what I want to what I want to tell you about, that's just the first interesting fact. What I want us to focus on is that not only do they have the strongest punch, but they also have the most incredible eyes of any animal. So you can see one of them poking out of the top and these big bulbous things. Now in our eyes, we have rods which help us to see movement, and we have cones which help us to see colour. There are three kinds of cones in a human eye, so we can see what are the three colours? Red, green, blue. Red, green, blue. Spot on. We've got some scientists here this morning. And that means we can also see any combination of those three different colours. You ever trying to imagine a different colour? Completely new colour? It's impossible, isn't it? Can't even begin to start because we've only got this one frame of reference. We've got three different kinds of cones in our eyes. The mantis shrimp has 16. It can see so many colours that our brains can't even process. It can see five different varieties of ultraviolet light. Incredible eyes. And so there are things that this creature can see that our minds can't even begin to process. But do you know that when a person becomes a Christian, they start to see things that they couldn't see before. There are things that our minds can't process by themselves. Let me give you two examples. In Psalm 119, verse 18, this is written, Open my eyes, that I may see wonderful things in your law. That's what the psalmist writes. Open my eyes so I can see these wonderful things. You see, without God's help, we can read the Bible, but fail to understand what it's saying to us. We can even read about Jesus' death and his resurrection, and it not really affect us, not really change us. It means nothing to us. But when God opens our eyes to see that these things are personal, that what the Lord Jesus did is for us, well, suddenly those words that we read have a new life and a new meaning. They have a, a beauty that we didn't see before. Second example. There's a hymn we sing, it has this line, this stanza. Heaven above is softer blue. Earth around is sweeter green. Something lives in every hue that Christless eyes have never seen. Birds with gladder songs overflow. Flowers with deeper beauty shine. Since I know, as now I know, I am his. And he is mine. You know, we can all drive to Milford Sound and stand in front of Mitre Peak, and every one of us can say, wow, isn't that incredible? But how much better, how much richer for the Christian who can stand in front of that, and sit, stand in front of that scene and say, wow, isn't that incredible? But even more incredible, I know the artist behind that landscape, I know the one who pulled my peak out of the ground, who formed that beautiful fjord. You can know him too. You can know this God. He can open your eyes to see beauty that you've never seen before, that you could never imagine. So you remember those words? You remember the mantis shrimp? You remember Psalm 119, 18? Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. May that be all of our prayer as we come to God's word in a, a short while. I'll turn back with me to Luke chapter 24. And let's pray together just before we come to God's word and ask him to help us as we look at it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, the hymns that we can sing together. We praise you for the freedom that we have to come before you. We thank you for this wonderful theme that can take up our minds and our hearts of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus, that Christ is risen and our hearts cry out, hallelujah, praise to the living God. Father, we pray that as we come to your words, as, your, as we come to your word now, that as we 
thought about the, the need that we have being able to open our eyes, that you would answer that prayer. Open our eyes that we would see the wonderful things in your word. Show us our Saviour this morning, we pray. Fill our vision with the Lord Jesus. We pray that he would be glorified above all things, that he would receive all the honour. We pray for those of us who don't know Jesus as Lord and Saviour, that you would open our eyes, specifically show us the truth of your word, and change each one of us, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. In the UK, there's a, a company that produces the real Easter egg. It's a chocolate egg, it's foil wrapped, and it looks like all the other ones on the shelf. But inside, there's a little book which explains the, the resurrection, the Easter story. Now, this year, many major supermarkets are refusing to stock them. And when they were asked why, one of the supermarkets responded, what has Easter got to do with God? Easter is all about God. It's about God doing something so amazing that it's almost unbelievable. That Jesus' arrest, torture, crucifixion were all part of God's plan to save sinners from hell. That his death and his burial were intended. And that three days later, he rose from the dead. Now all of you, I don't care how long you've been a Christian, can appreciate how unbelievable that sounds. Right? Because people don't come back from the dead, do they? We occasionally hear about people coming out of a coma or being resuscitated after a couple of minutes. But Jesus was crucified. The spear had been thrust into his side to prove that he was dead for three days. He'd been sealed in a tomb. No food, no water, because a corpse doesn't need food or water. And so we would all say, nobody comes back from that. Even Jesus' disciples, his closest friends, did not believe that he had risen. Look at this passage. Verse 13 to 17 sets the scene for us. There are two men. They're walking home to Emmaus. They are Jews. So they've been to Jerusalem for Passover. They go every year. But this time, two things are different. First of all, they're talking about what's happened. You see that there in verse 14. There was a teacher that I was working with who was very much looking forward to, I'm talking about years now, he was looking forward for years to a holiday in Russia. But on the first day that he was there, he fell down the hotel stairs and broke his leg. All he remembers from the holiday is the hospital. Passover was something that every Jew looked forward to. But this year there is a dark cloud hanging over the festival. And everyone is talking about it. It even amazes these men in verse 18 that they should have to explain to this man who's come alongside them what they're talking about. They say to him, you know, you've been living under a rock. Are you the only person here who doesn't know what's going on? The crucifixion of Jesus has dominated this weekend. The second thing that's different is that they are sad. They're not returning from the Passover full of joy. But we find out in verse 21 that these men are followers of the Lord Jesus. They believe that he was a mighty man of God. They even thought that he might be the Messiah. The one that God had promised would save his people and defeat the power of death and the devil. But it had all ended in tragedy. Their hopes were dead and buried with the Lord Jesus. And so it's with heavy hearts that these men are walking home. In their minds, everything has gone wrong. But the reason that they feel like this is because they are making three big mistakes. Mistake number one. They have closed minds. And what I mean by that is that they fail to remember God's word. 
The Old Testament was written over a period of almost 2,000 years. It was written by different authors in different places, quite big distances between them sometimes, and in different periods of time. Throughout that 2,000 year period, different pockets of writing. And yet all of these parts point forward to the coming of Jesus. How many of you have seen those portraits? And you see a face, but then when you look at it very closely, you see that it's made up of lots of tiny different photographs. You know what I'm talking about? Well, the Old Testament is exactly like that. It paints a big portrait for us of the coming Messiah. Jesus' face is there in big for us all to see. But it also shows us lots of tiny details about how that would happen. Even minute details, like prophecies about being struck in the face with a rod, soldiers gambling for his clothes. Who could have predicted something that detailed? It also told us that there would be a resurrection. In Psalm 16:10, King David said about the Lord Jesus, You will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. And what's more, the Lord Jesus had told his followers plainly. Matthew 20, 18 to 19. We're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. Jesus had said that weeks before it happened. Now Cleopas and his friend knew the Old Testament. And they knew the words of Jesus. That's why in verse 21 they highlight the significance of three days having passed since his death. But they still haven't grasped what Jesus and the scriptures were saying. Instead of remembering and trusting God's word, they've been overwhelmed by sadness. <clears throat> Mistake number two. They had closed hearts. They failed to believe God's love. A treadmill is great if you want to get fit. But it's useless if you want to get somewhere. <laughs> Most people who believe in God also believe that you have to reach Him. That it's all about self-improvement, self-effort. It's about being good to make your way to God. But that never works. Because God is so unreachable. If He wasn't unreachable, He wouldn't be God. If we could make our way to him, he'd just be one of many gods. But that's not the God of the Bible at all. And so that attitude to work our way to him, it's a treadmill. We can run on it all our lives. But when we jump off, we're right where we start. Now the glory of the gospel is not that it provides us with a way to God. But that God came to us. John 1.14, the Apostle John, who spent so much time with the Lord Jesus, says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. He's saying plainly, Jesus was God. Jesus is God. Everything God is in the form of man. That's the Lord Jesus. Hebrews 1.3 says the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being. God the Son came to earth. He lived a sinless life. He died an agonizing death. And that was God's plan. Who makes a plan like that? Who makes a plan to send their son to such a horrible death? What would motivate God to do that? Well, the answer is mind-blowing, isn't it? Because the answer is love. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son 
that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The perfect life that Jesus lived, that's what I need. I need that to be right with God, but none of us have it. By God's standard, we've missed the mark. We've broken his law, and we deserve death. Now, are you starting to see how God's great plan all comes together in the Lord Jesus? He has the perfect life that I need. He died the awful death that I deserve. But if the story ended there, all I could do is look at Jesus and see how far short I've come. I could just see how it's meant to be done and realize I'm not there. I'm not good enough. All I could see is how badly I failed. But God's plan is written out of love for us. That's why the second part of that verse says, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Elsewhere in scripture, God says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. You see, God's great plan, as unbelievable as it is, is written to do you good. That's why Jesus came, to do you good. You see, this perfect life that Jesus lived can be yours. The hell that Jesus suffered on the cross, that could be the spiritual death that you deserve. Your sin crushed. The Lord Jesus would do that for you. And to prove that he's able, to prove that he satisfied all of the demands of God's justice, to prove that he himself was spotless, the perfect lamb of God. He broke the power of death. Three days later, he rose from the grave. God has made a way by which your sin can be removed and forgiven. He's provided one escape route from hell to heaven. And that is the Lord Jesus. Acts 4.12 tells us plainly, salvation is found in no one else. Without Jesus, there is no hope of clearing our past. Without Jesus, there is no hope of forgiveness of sins. And so you can understand then why Cleopas and his friend are so miserable as they walk home. Because they think that that one hope is God. They think that Jesus is dead. Mistake number three. They have closed eyes. They failed to see that the Lord Jesus was with them. My uncle once asked me, uh, he said, you went to Aberystwyth University. Did you know a guy called Tom Smith? Well, I looked at him and I thought, and I thought, I thought that name sounds familiar. And uh, after about five minutes, I remembered I lived with Tom for a year. <laughs> but I never expected to talk to my uncle about Tom. I didn't understand how they knew each other. I couldn't make the connection. He'd asked me about him completely out of context. And we've all been in that place, haven't we, when somebody starts talking to us out of context, or we see somebody on holiday that we know from somewhere else, and we just can't place them. We just fail to recognize who they are. Imagine how hard it would have been for Jesus' disciples. They're expecting never to see him again. He is firmly in the box in their minds, dead and gone. Think about when Mary meets the risen Jesus outside the tomb. She sees him standing there. Oh, who's it going to be? Oh, it's probably the gardener. In the same way, these men don't realize he is walking alongside them. In fact, verse 16 says that they were kept from recognizing him. Imagine how different this journey would have been if they would have recognized who was with them. How quickly their sadness and unbelief would have vanished. But God keeps them from recognizing Jesus. And I believe that he does this so that the Lord Jesus can deal with their three mistakes in three specific ways. First of all, Jesus opened the scriptures. 
Their first problem was that they'd forgotten God's word. And so Jesus begins by opening it again. Read it there in verse 25 to 27. He said to them, How foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken! Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. What a sermon that would have been. <laughs> now if a building looks wonky, the first thing to check is the foundation. And the same is absolutely true for people. If you are unsure in the face of death, if you this morning are not 100% certain of heaven, then you need to examine your foundation. What is keeping you secure? Think, when you are stood before God in judgment, what are you going to have? What will your life be built on? There is a famous hymn that has the line, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. And that answers that question beautifully for us. If your answer is anything but Christ, you are in trouble. If your answer is something else, you're in trouble. If your answer is Christ plus something else, you are in trouble. There is one place for you to be stood this morning that guarantees your safety for all eternity. And that is Jesus Christ plus nothing. Christ, the solid rock. All other ground is sinking sand. So you must build your life on Jesus Christ. In the Bible, God lays out that foundation for you. We can read about Jesus and learn about Jesus from every page. Sinners like us can believe and stand on him. And although there will be times when we wobble, we can always come back to our foundation. Remind ourselves again how safe and secure we are on Christ. Jesus' second answer was to open their hearts. As we said earlier, the Bible is unlike any other book. To truly understand it requires spiritual discernment. It's not enough for us to read the words. We need God to speak to us through it. You know, whenever the Lord Jesus taught people, he would cry out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Everybody there heard his words with their ears, but not everybody there heard his words with their heart. You know, none of us, not one of us, will believe that the death of Jesus was for me. None of us will believe in his resurrection. Until we hear God speaking to our hearts, we can have all the evidence, and boy, is the evidence for the resurrection robust. We can have it all laid out in front of us, and still it would not convince us. The only thing that will make that difference is if God speaks to our hearts. And so all of you must pray this morning that God would do that for you. You know, it's the prayer of a skeptic, if you're a skeptic this morning. It's this prayer, God, if you are real, if you're really out there, speak to me this morning. Show me that you're real. You could pray like that, couldn't you? Whoever you are. Look at what God did for these poor, broken men. Verse 32. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? That is how it feels to have God dealing with you. Have you known a scratch of that this morning? Thirdly and finally, the last thing that the Lord Jesus did was that he opened their eyes. Suddenly the fog is gone. And they realize that the Lord Jesus has been with them all along. 
the Lord is risen. And how close had they been to missing out? How close had they been to not realising it? In Germany, in Freiburg, there's, there was a beautiful cathedral with a great organ. And every day the old organist would come and clean it and play it. And one day during his practice, a young man walked in and came up to him and said, could I play the organ? No. No way. Nobody touched his organ. So the young man sat in the pew and listened. Five minutes later, he came up again. Could I, could I play the organ? No. No way. So the young man sat back down and listened. Again, he came up. Would you mind if I played the organ while reluctantly the, the organist gave up and shuffled over a little bit, let the young man play. As he began to play the most beautiful organ music, filled the cathedral. And the old man looked at him and said, what's your name? He said, Mendelssohn. <laughs> those of you that don't know Mendelssohn, one of my favourite, one of the greatest composers of all time. The old man looked across at him and said, to think that I nearly didn't allow the master to play the organ. The greatest thing that the Lord Jesus Christ can do for men and women, boys and girls, is to open their eyes to see who he is. You see, there is not a single person, I don't care who you are or what you say about yourself, there is not a single person here this morning who would not immediately become a Christian if they could see just a slither of who the Lord Jesus is. Have you seen something of that this morning? Do you see, perhaps for the first time, your need of Him? If so, I beg you, do not miss your opportunity to come to the Lord Jesus, to let the master of life and death to deal with your sin, to take charge of your life, to let the one who rose from the dead take the wheel and guide you home to heaven. Christian friend, there's much for us to, to take from this. But do you just notice how tender the Lord Jesus is with these men as he talks to them? Look at how he leads them back to belief. These downcast, sorrowing, miserable disciples. Are we that gentle when we deal with a brother or sister who needs our help? Are we that compassionate when we share the gospel with a non-Christian friend? Yes, we must tell the truth. And we must tell it straight. But if we really believe that everything hangs on God taking that word, taking that witness, taking his scripture and making it real. If everything hangs on God speaking to and dealing with that person's heart. Shouldn't we be following this example of Christ? Laying the foundation of scripture tenderly. Speaking the truth gently and then humbly praying that God would use our witness and our words to open hearts and minds and eyes to see the risen Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Mighty God, we love you. We love you because you first loved us. And what a demonstration of divine love. That you would write this plan in the councils of heaven. To send your son. As perfect, as innocent, spotless and holy as he is. To die in the place of sinners like us. Father we pray. And we beg. Open eyes and hearts and minds. To see the saviour this morning. We pray that for all of us who are Christians, we want to love him more. We need motivation to give up the things of this world, to say no to self and to live for Christ. Show us the Saviour again, we pray, this Easter Sunday morning. 
Oh, we beg it for anybody who doesn't know you, Lord Jesus, as Lord, as King of their heart. Oh, we ask, open eyes and minds to see the beauty, the majesty, the worthiness of Jesus Christ. Give us faith. Help our unbelief. Enable us to trust in you, to put our life squarely in your hands, to leave it with you, relying on you to bring us safe home to heaven. We thank you for the confidence that we have that you will do that, all because Christ is risen. And we say, praise God. Hallelujah. Amen.